Westminster Tools head office here in Devon. It's Wednesday, it's four o'clock, we're in the routing room. Uh, today, uh, something just a little bit different. We've asked, we've got, we've got a Q and A, a question and answer session. Um, not necessarily about routing. Um, I think the, uh, the advertisement and the thing that I put out was ask Craig anything. A little bit of a worry, I've got to tell you, but you never know. I'm really interested to see what questions you guys have got for us. So it really is a question and answer session. If you're struggling with your bandsaw, what router cutter is best to do this? Um, finishes, uh, all sorts of stuff. I'm, I'm not the wood turner. We've got two fantastic wood turners in the company, Colwyn Way, Jason Breach. Uh, some of you may have caught Colwyn's um, live videos, Tuesdays and Thursdays, don't miss tomorrow's. Really interesting stuff. A whole variety of uh, hour-long um, information on wood turning. But today isn't necessarily about wood turning. If you've got any questions, I'll do my very best to answer. Behind the camera, I've got my friend and colleague, Ben. Say hello, Ben. Hello. <laughs> Ben's here. And Ben's going to be reading out your questions today. So, questions. And then I thought, if time allows, we'd have a little tour of my workshop. I'm always nosy. I'm always interested to see um, other people's workshops. So I thought you might like to have a look around one of ours, our routing room, we call it. Um, so why not? send me pictures of your workshop. I'm mad keen to see what you've got at home and what you guys are working with. So, enough waffle from me, it's over to you guys. Ben, I, I, I think we've got a question or two already. Yeah, Do we want to just fire prepared. away and see what we've got. Um, so first question from Harry Salvage Restoration. Hey Harry. What is the best Bosch router for the UJK router table? Ah, it's, it's the, the machine that we've been using uh, last week really. It's the GKF first, uh, uh, sorry, GMF 1600. Uh, so 1600 watt router, which drops in and out of the router table beautifully. Um, ben, can you can you just see me underneath the router table here? Come on over a little bit. Great camera work. Check it out. Now underneath here, we've got the motor unit. There we go. It just drops in and out really quickly, really easily. Can we pop that on there for you? Um, what I've got underneath the router mm -hmm. table is a nice chunky you can see the the orange colored aluminium table and that is bolted to nice and centrally bolted to the the fixed base and that stays in there all the time so i can drop the motor unit in and out for cutter change which makes it a lot easier underneath we've got a lovely fine height adjuster to get that cutter protruding through the perfect amount because we all know, particularly with some jointing cutters, getting that cutter height right is, is everything, it's critical. Um, also on this one, now we've not done it, but you've got the facility, now this is pretty cool. Where's he put it? He's got another base, there it is. This is that very base here, we've got a load of them. Um, you could drill a little hole just in the right spot here and you can, they supply you with a key so you can actually access all your height control from the top. Your orange plate is here, little hole in the top, and that is your fine height adjuster. So there isn't necessarily get on your hands and knees to, uh, to make that height control. So that's a pretty cool little setup. Um, powerful machine at 1600 watts. Um, I know some routers they go up to call crazy power, 2200, 3000 watts sometimes. I've never felt the need to go that powerful. Um, certainly with some of the big cutters that we have to swing in the skill centre, uh, like these panel raising bits, it handles it. It doesn't stall, stutter, slow down. Um, big favourite of mine. Um, yeah, yeah, like it. Recommended, absolutely. Uh, okay, Ben, have we got any more? Okay, so uh, we've got a question from um, Danny Jacobs. Danny? I have a Makita RP900X router, Yep. which is the most suitable router table? Now the RP900 is a quarter inch, nice little handheld moulded body style router. Um, I think the thing is, just about any router fits in any table. You wouldn't want to try and put a huge router in a mini table, although you probably could. And you could put a small router, a relatively small router, like yours, into the UJK table. Um, we understand a lot of people can't stretch to this, have no need for something as chunky and as heavy as this. 
A big favourite is the folding router table. Now I did kind of allude to it last week. Um, great for the home workshop. Can we can you kind of see that there, Ben? Mm -hmm. Great for the home workshop. Not massive in size, not massive on the wallet as well. I think it's about 190 quid. Folds up flat and will take just about any router. You can see we've got one of the Bosch routers, uh, quarter inch routers hung underneath there, um, which, which works really well, really well. So that would be a really good router table for your workshop and your router. Hopefully that uh, has helped a bit. Okay, so we're going back. Um, I think we've kind of already answered this one, but would you recommend the Bosch router for this table that, uh, in regards to last Wednesday's video? Oh, so I yeah. think we're talking about the... Yeah, it's, it's a similar sort of thing I, I answered the question previously. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's ease of use. Um, the motor drops in and out. You don't need to unbolt your router each time. You know, some people... I've only got one router, unlike me. I don't know why, but I've got five of them. I've no idea how I've amassed five. It's over many years, 30 years of doing this, so it's all right. Don't tell my missus, but yeah. Um, so yeah, one router bolting in and out each time you want to use a router table is quite a task. So that ability to drop that motor unit out of your router table and then quickly into the plunging base is, is great. These combination routers that come with plunging base and uh, fixed base, they're great. They're great. There's a lot of them now. There's a lot of them. Now, going back, you know, four or five years, it didn't really exist too much in the UK. But now it's, you know, there's many out there. Uh, we've got a couple of small versions here as well. Uh, ben, is that okay? We've got any more? We've got, yeah, we've got a couple more to go. Oh, they're coming um, in thick and fast. So we've got a question from Alan here. Um, I've recently bought an AT406 wood lathe and having no luck at finding a replacement dri drive belt. Ah, wood turning questions. What did I say? No, it's fine. It's fine. Um, yeah, drive belts, consumable item often, um, needs to be replaced, checked regularly, fairly regularly. A cracking lathe, by the way, good choice. Um, it's one of our, we're a, it's a favourite of ours here in the skill centre. We've got five or six of them in a you know, wood turning room just across the other side of our skill centre. Um, spare parts we generally don't put on the website, so if you're googling about for it, it's going to be really tough to find any spare parts, consumable items like that. Um, but I got this question before, I must say, so I have a part number for you Alan, pen poised, are you ready? Good. Okay, so the part number, if you give us a call to order, is 505-455. 18 pounds 60 and in stock okay we've got those it's been such a popular lathe for us that we'd never want to be out of that uh, that part so hopefully that's helped you out alan okay next question oh wow okay oh, catch my breath. <laughs> hey, hang, on, hang on just let me have a let me have a swig <laughs> hang on i've gone dry already i'm not even rating with any dust so we've got a question from joe joe um, it looks like Joe's making some really nice little bandsaw boxes and he's applying um, a spirit stain. Oh, can I have a look? I'm just going to go off camera for a second. <laughs> oh, I've got to love a bandsaw box. They are great, really colourful. Okay, love them. So he's, a, um, so he's staining them and he's then applying an acrylic varnish and the brush seems to be picking up the stain. Uh, um, any recommendations on how you can fix the stain um, and try and alleviate that problem? Yeah, I wouldn't say that I am an absolute finishing guru, but it happens to me. I do, I do like colour in my work, um, and I do make some kids' toys. I've been helping with, you may have seen some of the, the Beat the Boredom projects that we've done to, to get the kids occupied and maybe hands-on with a bit of woodworking. And some of those projects have been um, colourful, so we've had... A multiple number of colors all on the same sort of project and I've not figured out a way with the same brush to get one not bleeding into the other it just seems to no matter how long I leave it to dry it just seems to lift whether I'm using even an oil or, or a varnish 
Um, so what I've done, there's, there's kind of three things that I tend to do, depending on what project it is. Um, I'll tell you what then, just pass me that and that little aeroplane. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so this one you can see, we got red wings and this was dyed with the chestnut spirit stain. Beautiful to use, really vivid colours. We've got white, I lightened up the pine, and we've got the red, and I was really concerned that kind of this area might end up a bit pink. Uh, so what I did, I always do the, um, the lighter uh, uh, area first. If I do the red or the dark blue or the, or the black or whatever it is, and then brush onto the lighter, it really stands out. I found that working on the lighter and then going into the darker, it's hardly visible at all. It still will be there, it still does seem to lift. Um, so that's, that's one kind of thing. Start with the lighter, work on to the darker. You could use a different brush for each colour, particularly if you're your item like, like your bandsaw boxes, either the drawers will pop out and stuff like that. You could, um, you could use a different brush for a different colour, that will work really well. But depending on what the item is, I mean if it's a, a really functional item like a, like a tabletop or a, or a chopping board or something, this probably isn't going to work. But what I've kind of gone to liking quite a, quite a lot is these the spray lacquers. Again from Chestnut, big fan of Chestnut products, know Terry well. So this is a spray lacquer, all right? You haven't got to touch your item, man. It's just literally uh, a spray. There's no bleeding in of colors. It's a cracking finish, as most sprayed finishes are. You've got satins, you've got glosses, uh, and it's a really easy product to work with. Like I say, not necessarily good for, it's not the most durable finish, it's a lacquer. It sits on the surface and makes things look nice. So if it's a functional item that you've made, maybe not the best. Um, so kind of that's my three ways around it. Um, hopefully you've, you've found that useful. Thank you. So I've got one more here from Michael. Michael, hello. If I were to buy a quarter inch router versus a trimmer, which one would you recommend, oh. the router or the trimmer? If any brand would Craig recommend? Right. I tend not to use trimmers at the bench too much. Um, I'm just a, maybe it's the age, I don't know. I'm just an old school fan of the good old plunge router, the kind of equal looking handles, the the Elu style, if anybody's old enough to remember that. I've still got the lovely old MOF 96, it's a cracker. And a lot of modern routers are designed in and around that sort of, that look and that feel. Um, so the plunging would be my best, uh, advice. However, like I said earlier with the with the half inch router that comes with two bases. You've got the fixed base, kind of like a trimmer, and you've got the plunging base so you can do lettering easy and it's a little bit more controllable at the bench. Well there's two that really spring to mind. Um, first is, is a little cracking little tool. Here we go. Have a look at this one. So you've got the Bosch GKF 600, 600 watts, nice, light, compact. Uh, you can buy it as a, as a kit like this um, for 240 quid, I think. Ben's just looking on our website. Uh, yeah, 239. Two, so about 239. You have to forgive us with prices. We're not, we're not in the sales, really. We're, we're doers, not sellers. But, um, um, but yeah, but 239, and, and it's a lovely tool. So. So it comes out, right, so just like a mini version of the, the Bosch I've uh, got it hung under the router table. And then if I can find the arrows, there's a, there's a right way and a wrong way, there they are. All right, and then find the arrows here, that drops in, locks into position, clips in. This actually feels lovely in the hand. You know, you've, you, you, it feels, the, the grips are good, it feels like it's bigger than it is because you've got really good control there. Lovely size base, nice round equal base. Extraction comes with, you've got that lovely smooth plunge. You know, depth control with turret stop, on and off. Plunge lock lever is in a really convenient place, I like that. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's a good setup.
It is really good setup. All comes in a, the same sort of case together, I believe. Um, I like this. It's not the most powerful machine in the world, I must say. So if you're just doing light edge molding, a few tren trenches, a few grooves, a bit of nameplate work like we did in the first vid a couple of weeks ago, terrific. What a beautiful little tool for this. If there's something that you got maybe that needs a little bit more oomph, maybe you want to take it to a dovetail jig or something like that, that you just need maybe a little bit more power, DeWalt have got, and you may have seen me use this, DeWalt have got a similar sort of setup. All right, so a bit more power at 900 watts. Um, you've got variable speed, which is useful because generally with 900 watts, a bit more power, you might be looking to use bigger cutters, and with bigger cutters, you need to slow the speed down. Logical, I think. Anyway. But this one, just the same. Take that bit off. That's like a fine adjuster when you got it in the other base. And there we have it. And we use this one a lot in the skill center as we do a little Bosch. The great feels in the hand is kind of that equal handle thing that I'm kind of traditional style used to. Um, so that is two that gives you a combination of the both. If you were to say, well, I've just one router, none of this base business, what would you go for? I'm going to contradict myself a little bit here now, I expect. I know I said I like the equal handle thing. But I've been tuned into, turned on to a slightly different style of router over the last few years. Um, we've got the GOF 1250, 1250 watts and a quarter inch. That's powerful. It doesn't feel monstrously big at the bench. It's easy to handle. Got to say, took me a little while to get rid of this. Uh, sorry, get used to this different kind of handle configuration but it's got some lovely features. The built-in fine adjuster is sweet. Really good. If you're doing any real control work and you've got to get that depth just right, dovetail jig work, the, the cutter depth is, is critical if you're doing, uh, say, uh, a single pass half blind joint. It's, it's absolutely everything, you know? Your cutter depth, if you're doing something like this, is critical, it's everything and the ability just to tweak and fine tune is, is really nice. Um, we've also on this one got a lovely little spindle lock. So if we're changing cutters, flick that lever out of the way. I'm not sure whether you can see that just there. Flick that out of the way and then we can change the cutters. And it actually, it feels all right. It feels good in the hand. Waste clearance is really good. Where are the, the other two I showed you, they're plastic bolt-ons at the back which work okay. I always think they're just a little bit vulnerable, maybe. But this one is all integral. It's part of the base. It's all built in and taking the waste away right from source. So waste clearance on there. This is one that we use a lot in the courses. So, um, oh, do we have Yeah, we've got a question just come in uh, from Bill. Bill. When putting a reducer in a half inch collet yep. to make a quarter inch or eight mil router bit, yep. Do you get any wobble or shank flexing? No, you shouldn't. As long as you adhere to the three quarters of the length of the shank inside the collet. Now, I must say, those reducers, they're okay. They're never as good as a proper collet. So if you've got a half inch machine and you want to take it down because you've got a bunch of quarter inch cutters, try and invest in a quarter inch collet, not necessarily a sleeve. I find a sleeve is a is a stopgap. It's a, yeah, it, it works, but I wouldn't want to use it all the time. So they work, adhere to the, the kind of cutter projection bill, um, and you'll be all right. Definitely. Okay. Have we got any more? I think that's a, that's it for now. Wow, that was a great bunch of questions. We got a, we got a, got through a lot. Hopefully, I wasn't rabbiting on too fast for any of you guys to understand. Um, we want to encourage questions. We really want to get. We want to see your workshops. Don't forget that. I'm really keen to see your workshops. Maybe a router table set up, and we want to encourage interaction. And we want to encourage questions. We want to share our knowledge. Hope you guys are. Um, I think what we'll do. One little thing that I did allude to um, in both videos, uh, the first week and the second week, 
um, is, is cutter sharpening. Now some are cutters are very expensive. That's just the way it is. Um, and if you understood how, how quite how they're made, which I'm going to go through now, you'd understand that maybe you don't want to chuck them away. And there is some life in that cutter, even when it's just not perform, performing well and it's leaving burn marks and you can sharpen them up. Well, what I want to do for you, just quickly, let me get this airplane out of the way. Meow. Um, I'll, I'll just go through very quickly the step-by-step -step manufacturing process of the router car. I find it interesting, you might find it dull as dishwater, but it's kind of what I used to do years ago was, as, a, as a saw doctor. Yes, saw doctor is a thing, it's not all oh, that saw, I'm the doctor. It's repairing, sharpening, making cutters, router cutters, uh, bandsaw blades, circular saw blades, all that sort of stuff. So it's kind of as a 16 year old whippersnapper, that's where I started in this business about, um, yeah, about, 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 about 10 years ago. So I've got a little bit tray here of step by step then I don't know if you can get in a bit closer mm -hmm. what do you think how's that got everything in there perfect right perfecto so the router cutter that's how it starts it's a billet of steel high quality steel um, varying in shape and size depending on what router cutter is going to be produced so from that you go over to a lathe, an engineering, a metal, probably CNC, mass production style lathe, but a lathe nonetheless. And we can see already now from that to that, we've got the half inch shank coming on, and we've got the profile forming, the shape of the cutter starting to happen. We've even got the end that takes the bearing. A lot of these cutters, bearing guided, self-guiding that we looked at last week. So there. To that and then we go to a milling machine so engineering works here we've turned it now we need to put some slots in now these slots aren't straight through they're almost always kicked at an angle slightly and that gives you more of a shearing cut action so a straight chop it'd be more a shearing cut like, like using a kitchen knife and shearing through your leaks uh, I don't know why leaks um, but that's your milling putting two equal slots through there. Very precise. This has got to be very precise because you know the speed that these things are running at, any amount of error, uh, inaccuracy, creating vibration is dangerous, I guess. So from there we will it gets uh, sand blasted or shot blasted, probably silicon bead blasted, something like that. Um, that's really just to take off any, any swarf, any burrs, any residue left from any cutting fluid because this has got to be crisp and clean. All these faces here have got to be clean as. So it's starting to look pretty cool, pretty good there, isn't it? And then kind of that happens. It, it doesn't <laughs> look too good. Now what that is, that's the brazing process. Most cutters, not all, but most cutters these days are TCT. Tungsten carbide tipped. So you've got a slab of carbide, kind of to the shape of the, the profile shape, kind of to the shape we need. That is brazed into position here. Okay. It's not welded, it's brazed, because welding carbide is nigh on impossible. And you know the brass, the brazing is a really good adhesion from the carbide to the steel body. And we can see that. It looks a bit messy. But that's okay, because we go back to the bead blaster, or the shot blaster, and it starts to look and resemble more of a router cutter. We haven't quite got sharp cutting edges. We have a lick of paint. No, it's, yeah, yeah, your corporate colours, your white, your reds, your blacks, whatever that is. But it's, it's, um, it, it's a, like an easy slip paint that doesn't, uh, it's quite, it's very smooth, very durable, that doesn't attract resin and stuff, so you won't get it all clogged up within no time. So from there, then we get sharp edges. It's ground using CNC diamond grinders. You get a diamond wheel coming in here, and that, what was the milled face, and then you get a special shaped diamond wheel picking up all of this detail here, and we are sharp, and that is sharp. Bearing is fitted, all right, there we go, because it's a bearing guided cutter. And then packaging of some description, other reusable like ours that you can 
keep it safe, stick it on the shelf, get your, get your display going on, get your collection of router cutters going on. Um, you know, and you can see that this particular cutter is the one that produced that moulding. Right. You've got that shape there. So there's quite a lot goes into making a router cutter. So, you know, maybe understand why sometimes they just cost what they cost. There's a lot to it, and every router cutter is made in that way. So, you don't want to be chucking them away, in my opinion. We want to look at sharpening, and it's a simple thing. It's got to be done with a diamond stone of some description. Uh, you don't want to go too coarse, because you'll do more damage than good. You will blunt more than sharpen. Um, this is a little four-sided thing here. I'll only ever use the 320 grit. You know, this is 120, 180, 240, 320 grit. So it's really quite smooth there. And what we're looking to do, uh, which one shall I select? Let's select. That's one. All right. Now we've got quite an intricate shape on the actual profile here. Really difficult to try and file in there and sharpen that. But you don't do that. We've got a flat face in here where the milling happened way back and then the tungsten tip was stuck on. You're looking to sharpen that face. If you want a top tip from sharpeners who sharpen all sorts of stuff, get a black marker pen and just black out this area here, this surface, just in there, that face. Black it out and then you can tell where you've touched and where you haven't. And the idea is you want to keep whatever you're using, the diamond lap that you're using, flat to the surface. If you kick over, you're going to blunt. If you kick back, you're just not going to touch that cutting edge. And it's, I normally do 10 strokes, turn it over, 10 strokes. So we're trying to keep the cutting edges equal. And the idea, the top tip really is little and often with all sharpening. Don't let it get so black, so burnt, so blunt that you really can't tell what it was once. Um, it's too late. It's just too late. So, you know, good practice. And of course, this is what I do. Before I put the router cutter back away in my box, I give it a shot. But, uh, but just little and often, that's the tip. You know? So just a... And then flip it over. You can really feel if that's flat or not. If you're not sure about that, like I say, the little black marker pen on the, on the face that you're actually finishing or, or sharpening. Should have counted those, I felt about the same. All right. Okay. Oh, you got a question? Yeah, got, <coughs> excuse me. I feel, uh, feels better already, actually, Ben. Oh, good stuff. It feels sharp. That's a useful tool, that. It is, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, so, we've got a question from uh, David Grimmer. Best value router for kitchen worktops. Bum, 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 bum. I am a D. What is two? That word value. Um, I like the D. Well, DW six two five E K. I haven't got one in here. Um, it's a cracker. Uh, but we're talking value. There's a fairly new-ish trend T seven. Uh, powerful thing. Nice and simple. Really good for, for doing the worktops. Um, there's not really too many bells and whistles on it. Uh, it comes with a 30mm template guide bush that you need to run on your, your, your worktop jig. So I think that, that's a cracker. Um, but if it's something that I'm doing all the time, it's my job, can't have it let me down. I've got to have top kit. Absolutely love the DeWalt DW625EK. It's a, it's a fan's favourite. Yes, I do have one at home. Oh, another one. Another question here. Yeah, uh, we've got another David, David Martin. Hello, David. So he's just inlaid this, um, the T track that we've got on our, our bench here. Oh, superb. Do the UJK hold down clamps as per on your bench now fit? Yes. They do. You see them in, in use. Uh, so really using the track saw clamps successfully, but the hold down clamps could be useful. They are a godsend. I've recently. Um, redone my bench at home actually um, and it was a big old school thing I used to uh, buy and sell second hand machinery way back way back and you'd always end up if a, a, a school was having a big clear out there'd be some big old 1910 bench kicking around and I have one of those and I've converted the top 
into this really modern style. It looks, looks a bit weird, I've got to say, you've got really old chunky solid legs that are about 100 years old, and my super modern looking bench top. Hey, but it, it, but it really works. And these clamps have been terrific. Um, even if I've got a little diamond stone, all right? Double-sided, 1,000 grit, 400 grit. And you must be psychic, because I was literally just about to do this to, to show off another little way of sharpening router colours. All right. So you're going to start a bit of sharpening now. Do you need lapping fluid when you sharpen? I think it's wise. And what lapping fluid does really is, is two things. It stops clogging, because obviously you're removing material when you're sharpening. Whether you're sharpening by hand or a grinder, you're moving material to you know, bring those facets back together, those two angles back together at a point, because they're rounded off. So you've got to remove material to do that. That material ends up clogging your, your stone of some description and the fluid helps stop that clogging. Also, a proper lapping fluid as such, something like... Here's some... Uh -huh. um, it's anti-corrosion as well. You don't want to use just water and then leave water lying around in the workshop, because stuff rusts, you know? Um, these are just steel cutters, I know carbide doesn't rust, rust as such, but the shanks that you cut as well, the stone wheel, so yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, just these on sharpening. And again, I'm just trying to keep the flat inside face against the flat of the stone. So that's just a, another way of doing it. Right, have we any more? That's it for now. All right, okay, well that's been great. Real good questions, very interesting, so I thank you. Um, I think, if it's okay with you, we'll have a little shifty around my workshop um, and then I've got a question for you at the end actually, something that I need your help with. So, you want to follow me Ben? Do not trip over with the camera? Come on. I'm going to come this way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we've seen the corner, we've, kind of, we've been working in this corner for the last, the last few weeks with our rounded table. We've got a few bits of jigs and bits and pieces here. We've got the folding around the table. So let's, let's come on around the corner. Okay. Nice chunky benches. We've got a couple of Joburg benches in here. Uh, cracking benches. Uh, nice and solid. Very simple. Nice and easy to put together, isn't they, Ben? Yeah, they're yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not too much uh, nuts and bolts. It was like, oh, that was easy. Right. Come on round. All right. Okay, so we're heading on down to the other side of the workshop. We'll go past our sharpening area. Uh, there's all sorts of sharpening happening here. Um, from hand sharpening on diamond stones, Japanese water stones, using a number of different jigs, powered sharpening on the ultimate edge here, a forward and reverse variable speed job. Uh, with a standard bar, so taking very, very common style, Tormac style jigs. Um, really good way to sharpen. I do like it. I'm also traditional fan of the Tormac. Been around a long time. That, that whetstone sharpening system, always retaining the original temper of the steel. Um, the jigs just make it, I was going to say foolproof. Is anything ever foolproof? But it is. It is just so simple. So we have quite a few Tormex in this room. We've got a couple of Tormex in our other room, our wood ceiling room. So quite a fan, aren't we, Ben? Yeah, they're great. Yeah, they are great. All right, come on down. The big red cabinet. But in that big red cabinet, I don't know if you can see that carving. Uh, we do a lot of carving here. So we've got plans, hair plans. We've got a variety of different whittling knives and chisels and stuff so that's that now we're coming on to our sharpening I'm uh, sorry our sanding station uh, where we've got two Merkers we've got two Merker Diros sanders so the 150 size hooked up to auto switching uh, extraction with it with a soft top table all right because generally we're, we're, we're finishing here and we don't want to dent or scuff any of the fine work up that we make so we've got a soft top table, 
Um, you know, a few bits and pieces like the pad savers or the flexi pad saver. Then we put Velcro strips up here just to keep it all together. Place for everything and everything in its place. I'm sure your workshop's like that. I know mine is. Power tools, yeah, got lots of power tools here. We've got a, a Bosch drills, both uh, the, the compact 10.8s and some nice powerful 18 volts. So come on round. All right, well, we've got a, we've got a project on the go here. Uh, this is a colleague of mine has made the table. I've glued it up for him today. Uh, it's one of our courses, uh, the, the, the table course, funnily enough, side table course. Um, so yeah, we've, we've got the table legs gluing up. They should be glued up by the time we've finished chit-chatting here today. All right, cool. Um, a little router area. We've got, I don't know, we must have about a dozen routers in here of various different types. From Fez tools to Bosch Pro to Bosch Green, you know the Bosch Green stuff. Actually, this tool, although it is chunky for a quarter-inch router, I mean 1,200 watts on a quarter-inch router feels good in the hand. Doesn't have the refinements and the, the fine adjusters as say something like the Pro, but it's nowhere near the money. But it is what it is. Yeah, real workshop, proper shavings and everything, uh, proper mess. I did have a bit of a clean up before I showed you guys around, but. Um, now we're on to our hand tool wall, a variety of different brands and, and styles, some very traditional stuff like uh, draw knives and spoke shaves, rasps, uh, different brands from, from Ryder through to Lai Nielsen and Veritas, Japanese chisels uh, and the, the more traditional bevel edge chisels with the boxwood handles. Alright, so into clamp corner, all right, and out for organization. Love it, we've got the clamp racks on the wall. So G cramps in six, uh, four inch, traditional sash. We've got these lovely parallel clamps that I was, uh, parallel jaw clamps that I was using to make glue up the table. All right, okay, so we'll pan on round, Ben, can you, you all right there? Mm -hmm. Some great camera work going on. <laughs> all right, can you get this? So, what have you got here? So we've got the table top for our table legs. I'm just gluing that up now using these pretty simple, traditional kind of panel clamps. Um, you buy them as a pair, then you, you drill some holes into quite sturdy, substantial bits of wood and clamp it up. Great for the table tops. That's nice and flat, little finish needed, cut to size and then fixed to the legs. Maybe I'll finish that up and show you next week. All right, coming on round, we okay? Mm-hmm. All right. A few of our craft machines here. Uh, we've got a thickness there, we've got a sand there, there's a scroll saw just there. Because in here we've been working with, like I say, I don't know whether you guys have seen the Beat the Boredom projects for the kids that we've been putting out over the next, over the last few weeks. But here's, here's some bits and pieces here. And we've been using our craft machinery to great effect making all sorts of stuff, uh, either that, um, so yeah, yeah, uh, here we've got just preparation, playing with colour really, to do to do our next Beat the Boredom project. Um, what we got here then, Ben, we got safety station, PPE, safety specs, ear defenders, dust masks, we've got a trade bandsaw, a 14 inch 350 trade bandsaw, uh, real favourite. Okay, come on round. Of course, extraction, you know, you'll see a lot of these extractors down here, Ben. Can you get down there, mate? Mm -hmm. Lovely. So, the NVD 750, pneumatic, British made extractor, vacuum type extractor, closed filter system, fast air, looks after the, uh, contains the fine dust. A great all-rounder. We've got them hooked up to the router table, we use them in the wood turning room, we've got one hooked up to a bandsaw here. Uh, so that's a that's a real bonus. Um, um, pillar drill, kind of drilling station. Now this is what I need your help with. Um, I've got in mind, we recently kind of rejigged this area, and I've got in mind to make uh, somewhere to, a, a drilling holder a wall mounted drilling holder, put all my drill bits in order so my forcing bits are together, my lip and spurs are together, my metal bits are together because 
you know, I, I have organised this. It's a little bit tidier than it normally is and chucked in a box together. You spend more time hunting for the drill bit than you do actually using the drill bit. Um, so I want to see your designs. If you've got them in your workshop, if you've figured out something to put on the wall to house all your drill bits, please share it with me. Give me some ideas. I've been having a Google around and I've got a couple of ideas, but nothing that's really floating my boat, I must say. So I really would like to see your, uh, your ideas, so please share them with us. Um, that would be really, really handy. Come on round. We're almost done, Ben. Rick, have we got a question? We've got another question oh, coming. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll stand this here. is Tormex, as we were talking Tormex. Oh, cool, yeah. Um, is hey, the... Maybe I'll throw this one. Ben, Ben's our resident <laughs> Tormex expert, by the way. <laughs> Go on. So, um, the, the Tormek, um, we can get the diamond wheel for that now. Yes, yes. Which is better, the stone or the diamond wheel? <sighs> oh, I'm going to go fine grit diamond wheel. Ben, what do you think? I love the diamond wheel, really useful. You don't get any of the kind of uh, changing of shape of the stone. Yeah. Um, the wheel has done us proud for, for years and years. We yeah. still use that a lot and we've got that fixed to the majority of our machines, yeah. um, but that diamond one, especially for people sharpening things like kitchen knives, things like that, yeah. uh, where you don't lose any of the um, the profile of the stone. It's the shape, isn't it? It's um, it's a real yeah. winner. Yeah. It kind, of, I guess, it kind of depends on what you're you're doing a lot of the time. But it does, yeah. I mean, certainly, I think if you're kind of wood turning tools and you sharpen a lot in the middle of the wheel, you got that fingernail gouge going in the middle, and it creates that dip in the wheel. Then you got to dress off the top surface of the wheel, you don't get any of that, do you? No. It's just that wheel stays square, straight, yeah. So, fine diamond, Are we, we agree fine on Fine diamond, that? yeah, fine diamond. good. Excellent. Come on up, come on round. Okay. Table saw, not a massive one, but a really sweet, accurate one. Um, when we do the routing course in here, we have to size a lot of material, we have cut off to length, really, um, even you know, cutting off rails and styles to make uh, kitchen cabinet doors, you know, with a round of cutters. Um, and these surfaces have got to be clean cut. They've got to be square. And that the sliding carriage of this is is sweet. It's really smooth. It's not massive. The machine's not too big and bulky. We got out on a set of wheels as well. Can you get the wheels in? Yeah. There's a variety of different wheels. This is a slightly older design. We've got a. I think we've got an offer on the moment actually, and that's just by chance. Um, so, you know, a lot of workshops, certainly mine, I know I've got to move my bandsaw around a little bit when I need to use it. Um, but a nice table saw, induction motor, quiet running, eight inch blade, cast iron table. It's, I like it. It goes well, doesn't it? You yeah, like that one. Point. Right, come on round. I think we're just about done. So we've got another MVD 750 behind the table saw. We've got another MVD 750 behind the router table. A great all-rounder. They really are really good. And I like the British made thing. I don't know about you, but... Yeah, uh, great Um, Unless we've got any more questions... I think that's it. Oh, wow. Uh, what an enjoyable session. Thank you for your questions. They've been really interesting. Um, tapped into my knowledge and Ben's as well. I'm glad he was here, tall Mac man. Um, next week, we're back to routing. I think what we'll do, we'll look at something just a little bit more complex and we'll look at a sliding dovetail. So using that dovetail cutter that you get in the box, putting it to good effect. Um, sliding dovetail is, is happening next week. Now, what would you use a sliding dovetail for? I've used it, you know, used it on this little cabinet, I was playing with dovetail jigs. Just these little drop shelves, this little uh, first level drop shelf here. Sliding dovetail all the way through to create the shelf. Very, very strong, but really, you know, if you want to see these ends, sometimes they're blind, you don't see them, but you can make a feature of it. And it really does look nice. So that's what we're going to look at next week. Um, we'll probably look at a combination then of bench work and router table work coming together to do the joint and how the, the, the two kind of methods if you like can can work uh, closely together um that is just about all we've got time for today 
Once again, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your questions. Um, have we got any more? Are we Is it poised? Uh, no, that's it. Okay, so as I said, don't forget to check out Colwyn's Wood Turning uh, live tomorrow at four. Um, all remains to say is thank you very much once again. Goodbye. See you at four next Wednesday. Bye.